Thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, and I'm sure you probably all do, I'm Mark Sandoval. I'm the Harbor Director here for Shell Islands Harbor. Uh, this is our fourth installment of the Harbor Academy. If you've been here before, and I think most of you actually have, maybe even all three, this is our fourth. And I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming out. I appreciate you spending the night with the evening with us. Um, but before I get started, I'd like to, uh, to uh, have a hand for the food. Yeah. We'll see us. <laughs> so CSU Chow Islands has uh, set the bar pretty high. Thankfully, this is the, the fourth installment, or I'd be like, oh my, I gotta, I gotta answer this one. All I've been supplying is popcorn and peanuts, I think. But, uh, but thank you. Very good spread, and we definitely appreciate it. So the way this is going to go tonight is I'm going to start out, um, and then I'll, I'll kind of talk about the history and, and, uh, of, of the center. Um, and then I'll turn it over to the university, and they'll talk about um, they'll talk about the programs, actually what goes on here, what the center is, what the center isn't. Um, and like I said, I appreciate you being here. So as as you know, if you've heard me speak before, I'm relatively new here. Uh, I haven't even hit the year anniversary as the director. So I obviously was not here for the history of the building, the development. Uh, the planning of, of this boating center, um, but it was uh, for those of you that were here and followed what was going on. It was uh, it was a little controversial, and um, and so I hope as I go through the history and the funding, which is going to be my piece of it, that it answers some of the questions that you might have as to as to uh, the timing of it, the funding of it, etc. So I'll get started, then I'll turn it over to the university. So it, this. Uh, so this actually started in 1999, and what, what happened was that the, 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 what was the Department of Boating and Waterways back there, it's now actually the Division of Boating and Waterways, um, that's the uh, it's a, a, a division of the Department of Parks, um, they, they, were, they were granting funds for boating centers. And there were a number of uh, harbors that took advantage of this, and Channel Islands Harbor was a harbor that you know kind of begged to have a boating center. We didn't have one, so a consortium was pulled together of us and the university to build to to uh, request funds, grant funds from the Department of Boating and Waterways, and build a boating center. And that happened in 1999 as this project was developed. In 2000, the Department of Boating and Waterways approved funding for the center. So this happened 19 years ago. In 2001, we did a preliminary design. And then in 2002, we did, we being the county, did a mitigated negative declaration. So what that is, is that's, that's a CEQA, that's a CEQA process that, um, that is not an EIR. So it's a step below the EIR, an uh, environmental impact report. But it's still part of the CEQA process. And so they decided back then to do a mitigated negative declaration. And I think we probably, and I'm reading the tea leaves here, um, there were probably residents who said, no, it's not good enough, let's do an EIR. And, 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 and so we did. I think we expanded that into an EIR. And, um, and that happened in 2003. And it was certified, prepared and certified in 2003. In 2004, our first lawsuit hit us, ours being the process, the county and the process. And it was the Beacon Foundation, and I'm not going to try to define who they were. I know there was um, one resident who lived in Hollywood Beach who kind of led the charge. But the Beacon Foundation um, filed a lawsuit against the EIR, questioning the EIR. And the county prevailed that, that the EIR was sufficient. So uh, that same year, we, the county, did a uh, public works plan amendment. And what that is, and if you were here for my planning and development session when I explained what, a, what the public works plan is, that's kind of the overarching development plan that the county has with the state. And it needed an amendment because the zoning didn't match what we were going to do here. So we went to the Coastal Commission for a public works plan amendment. And that was what was litigated. That the, the Deacon brought a lawsuit against that as well. And 
we prevailed, we beat the county. And so we moved forward. And in 2005, the voting center project was approved by the Coastal Commission. That same year, the third lawsuit hit us. And that was by uh, Habitat Hollywood Beach. And some of you in the room may know better than me. It's not Beacon, probably still has some of the same members. Um, in any event, it was, it was the third lawsuit that this project faced. And, and what they were questioning was the coastal permit. And so we got involved in the, our third round of litigation on, on, for the voting center. And then 2007, 2008, we finally prevailed. We, the county and the project finally prevailed. And, um, and did a new, uh, essentially what the Coastal Commission did was in 2008, and as I understand it, there were a series of meetings, Coastal Commission meetings, where this all happened. But it, they finally rescinded the 2005 uh, permit. They said, okay, we're going to throw that permit out, and we're going to re-permit it. And in May of 2008, issued the second and current uh, Coastal Permit for the, the, the voting center. And then between 2008 and 2010, so now we had the coastal permit, but obviously that's not the only permit you need when you're building on the ocean. You need federal permits, you need Army Corps, you need Water Corps, you need all those. So, so the county set about getting all those permits. In addition to that, um, they re-valued re the project and found because nine years had transpired, nine to ten years had transpired, that the funding was insufficient. So in addition to uh, getting the, the permits that were needed for the center, they started a fundraising effort. And that happened in the two years, uh, 2008 to 2010. 2010 to 11, final construction drawings. Fall of 11, had the groundbreaking. And spring of 2013, construction was complete. So from 1999 to 2013 is the period of from conception and initial funding from the Department of Voting and Waterways to actually opening up the, the voting center. Um, and we get asked about that, why did it take so long? Uh, I mean, waterfront development just takes long. You were at my development session, you saw why, why a lot of times it does take this. But in this one, there were three different lawsuits that, that we had to go through to get us here. Question? Is it possible to give any kind of a reason as to what was the underlying resistance to the project? I have no idea why anybody was against it. Well, I think, that, uh, as I understand it, and believe me, I can be corrected because I wasn't here. Um, I think initially it was because the voting center was envisioned on Victoria. And I think there was more acceptance on Victoria. And then it was moved over to Harbor, and, and I don't know why. <laughs> so, so it was moved to Harbor Boulevard. It was envisioned in the 2000 and um, the 1998 plan uh, for the build out of the harbor. That it, it was going to be on Fisherman's Wharf and it was going to anchor that whole eastern part of. Uh, but there was a lot of controversy about the winds. Some of the um, sailors said that the prevailing winds, which are onshore winds, would be uh, too difficult on the east side for the novice sailors who were going to be learning here. Mm -hmm. And another group said that, in fact, the onshore winds, which are the Santa Ana winds, as we know them, were just as powerful, and that it would be better if the sailors were on the west side, uh, were on the east side, on the east and side. it would be easier to turn around. The turning around was the issue. But the first issue that came up on the west side was the way that the voting center was envisioned. They were going to cut down all the trees that are just north of here. And all of those trees had nesting herons. And that drove the community insane. And I was one of those insane people. I was here for every minute of this, participated in all these lawsuits. And people fought tooth and nail. And one of the reasons that this classroom is configured in such a difficult manner that it's hard to use is that in order to cut down fewer trees and do less damage to the wildlife, 
um, they had to rotate the facility. That was one of the things that changed. So that was, that was actually a tree issue, not a view issue? Well, it was two things. It was a view issue because the people across the street were very upset about the their views. But under all of this was uh, really anger at wrecking the wildlife and the heat. And, and we had incredible presentations with pictures of fledglings and nests. I mean, what a so that was, and, and the other thing, the thing that really probably ruined it all and, and had it been done differently and it would be done differently today, I have every confidence, is that it was discovered that the voting center was going to be in this spot and somebody took a walk and there was a sign that had been driven into the ground saying future home of the voting center. And that started. So this was before a decision was actually publicized. This was before yeah. anybody even knew that a voting center was in the works. On this side or on either side? On either side, because we had not known that this was, as usual, we did not know that this was in the works. That the so this was in 98? This was around 98, 99. And I mean, it, it really just, you know, it controlled everyone's life for over 14 10 years. <laughs> 14 years. Another factor was the traffic, because the anticipation was there were going to be hordes of school buses coming on to Here, on the because the, it was supposed to be a center for the community. Mm -hmm. And so ah. that was the other thing, mm -hmm. that expectation of what the traffic would be like. Mm -hmm. okay. So, here we are, 2013, finally opened it. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the partners to get us there and, uh, and funding. So the partners we had to, to open this up, obviously the county um, and the university were, were partners. We had the Department of Boating and Waterways back then with the seed funding. In fact, it's not just seed funding, it was a significant amount of funding. Um, we had California State Parks, they, they uh, put some money towards it, and I'll get into that. We had uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the federal government, and then we had the foundation of Martin, Martin Budd and Martha Smith that also were uh, big donors for the project. So, so look at what it ended up costing us. The, the building itself ended up costing us seven, almost $7.4 million. Then we had other non-voting center costs, um, a street improvement of about $718,000, an educational exhibit of $815,000. So the project total was just south of $8.9 million. The Department of Boating and Waterways, so their, their funding, uh, as I said, pretty significant, was $3,250,000. And what they paid for was the boathouse, the boathouse, part of the boathouse, the uh, locker rooms and the docks. So that was their contribution. <clears throat> the Department of Parks, they were, uh, through a grant, Prop 84 grant, they granted uh, for educational programs. So they paid for the 3D map display on the exterior of the building, and they, they funded the exhibit space that's in the lobby. And they also funded part of the restroom. I think they divvied up the building and said, okay, our portion, the exhibit space is X, and so we'll pay for a little bit of the restroom. Uh, NOAA, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, uh, which is part of NOAA, the federal government, they, they funded $815,000, and that was for all of the uh, educational exhibits down in the lobby. And then, as I said, we had private donations of $1,139,000. Of that, a million dollars came from the Martin B. and Martha K. Smith Foundation, or Bud Smith, who was the first developer of the harbor. So where that left us, as the harbor department was, um, we had to fund the, uh, the street improvements. And again, I wasn't here, but what I hear is that there was an expectation, if not an agreement, that the city would do it because they're city streets. And apparently that fell through for whatever reason. So the city, the county, um, the county actually funded the street improvements. And then we were short of uh, the $8.9 million. We were short by a little over $2.3 million. Um, so the, the county funded that. And, um, and, you know, and that was a pretty significant chunk of change uh, back in, you know, the early part of this decade. 
and um, and I don't I, I want to bring it up just because I have to that you know some of these things some of these expenditures we've had for this in the lifeguard stand now have, have kind of backed up our administration building or our harbor our harbor patrol headquarters because now I'm a little strapped for cash. And this is one of the reasons why, because we hadn't anticipated putting $3 million into this facility, but we did. And, um, and, and therefore, it's, putting, it's, it's making us struggle for the Harbor Patrol headquarters, which is something I've got to figure out how to do, and we're trying to figure that out. Uh, the, 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 the one thing I wanted to point out is, and I don't know if I've, if I've mentioned it in any other Harbor Academy, the source of the funds, in fact, I have the first one, the source of the funds for all of the Harbor Department comes from essentially ground leases and it basically rent. Rent from all of the lessees, whether they're you know, centers like the Emporium, whether they're marinas, we get a piece of their revenue. And that is the sole funding source, you know, pretty, much, pretty much the sole funding source for everything the Harbor Department does. It funds all the capital, uh, capital projects that we fund, it also funds our operation. So, and the reason I'm bringing this up, with the exception of we get $600,000 from the general fund of the county, because we're maintaining and, and guarding the beaches, uh, particularly during the summer. So we do get 600,000 from the county, from their general fund. But other than that, every dollar comes from the businesses, from the operation of the harbor. So I know, I, I think that there's a perception out there with, with it's our money, it's tax money, it's, uh, you know, so, so, so you should run the center like this. I just wanted to point out that all the funds that came from the Harbor Department didn't come from general tax money, it came from the, essentially the businesses of the Harbor. And, and I think that's important to understand as, you, as we go through the, uh, the, the operations of the center and, and what, again, what the center does and what it doesn't do. So, and, it, 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 and the two, that $2.3 million, it wasn't just the, the shortfall of the construction. And by that time, by 2013, we had also had to fund, you know, fund defense of all of the litigation. So there were a lot of things that went in. We funded all the permitting, et cetera, et cetera. But not to bore you, but it was a pretty good chunk of change. We ended up, me and the Harvard partner, ended up funding over $3 million for the seminar, so, which was almost the DBOP, the DBOP amount. So, I mean, that ends my portion of the presentation. I wanted to go to the, go to the timeline and the funding, and I can answer questions, or we can go to the university and, and answer them at the, at the end, of, Patricia. Was the, was the Bowdoin Waterways a grant, or was yes. that cash in one year? It's a grant. So how, you're still paying on it? No, no, that, it's not a loan, it's a grant. It's free money. Oh, grant. oh free, okay. Oh, free money, okay, yeah. And, 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 and DBOP money, just since you asked, or you didn't ask, but I can tell you, that isn't tax money either. The lion's share of the department, the, what is now the division of boating waterway, that comes from a, a tax on fuel sales, on marine fuel sales. And boat they, licensing. And, and boat licensing, that's right. That's where they get those money. So really, no tax money went to it. That comes from boaters. It, that comes from boaters, as, as does, I mean, it, when you go to Seafresh, you're actually helping the 2.3 million, because I do get money on the back end, but it's not direct. So yes, I mean, uh, in a way, yes, you know, the, the general population is. Okay. Um, because you're talking about the Harbor, and it's a very interesting dynamic, uh, and, and um, often compared to the Ventura Harbor. And although we all are under the Ventura County, they are run so differently and funded so differently. Why did they set it up that way? And can you kind of fill in the blanks? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why did they? Do that? I don't. I don't. I, I know that this is since, since the mid '60s. This is the way this is operated. Why? Why the Ventura Harbor is run out of, under a port authority? I'd have to find out and let everyone know. I don't know. I don't know why they're run under a port authority and we're run as we are and have been since the beginning of time. When the voting center was proposed, what was its purpose and how has that changed over time? Yeah, why don't we let why don't we go to the university? That, that may be answered or if not, it may be better answered by them. So let's we'll hold off on that question. Uh, back to Audrey's question. I know you have talked a lot to Tom Volk. He knows the answer to that, but there was a point in time, and I can't remember how far back it was, that the Ventura Harbor either 
declared bankruptcy or almost declared bankruptcy and they had a different model. And the model that they have now came out of that experience where they thought that um, they really wouldn't be able to operate anymore. So this new way of operating is relatively new and has been very successful. And it was and it was a result of a financial I, I problem they had sometime in the I don't want to say 100%, but I think yeah. that's what happened. I was about to turn it around because I know he's yeah, turned around forever, too. Maybe that was true, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Many things I've heard are not true. The lady here that talked about the history of Beacon and so on, that's superficial that you, that you saw. The real rub, and I, I like the gentleman that asked who in the world would be against this center. I mean, I certainly asked that question for a long time, and as, as a long-term lessee in this harbor, I can tell you that we've contributed, me and my partners have contributed more than $20 million towards keeping Mark out of debt. But uh, <laughs> um, the real underlying issue with this and so much more was really John Flynn. And John Flynn created the Channel Islands Beach Community Services District. That was created partly to control what went on around the harbor. And when the harbor became, the harbor used to operate under, um, God, it was downstairs. I can't remember the name of the agency, but it was just a part of it. When it became a it department, part of GSA. It was GSA, part of there GSA. you go. General Services. Part of Parks, yeah. yeah General yeah. Services Administration. To the and John Parks. Flynn used to take money out of the harbor, spend it right. to get favors and votes in other parts of Ventura County. And supported the parks. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, he's he, part of the parks. He would park. take that money and put it into parks and so on. So when the county decided to make this a separate department, not under GSA, then all of the supervisors had a say in what went on and felt they should because the harbor is such an important part. Prior to that, it was John Flynn's district and you better not screw around in John's district. Um, I, I, I mean, just as an aside, I know I, I screwed around in John's district. <laughs> In how many ways? <laughs> and, and he literally, on the dais, accused me of a serious felony of bribing a government official. Luckily, the other members of the Board of Supervisors jumped right in and said, we need to have an immediate investigation, and things were overturned very quickly. Back to your question about the Ventura Port District, having operated both in this harbor for 30 years and in Ventura Harbor for 30 years, Yes, there was a Chapter 9 bankruptcy, but the structure of the harbor existed far before that because, partly because of just what happened. The city of Ventura did not, wanted an arm's length from this harbor venture that was going to occur. They didn't want to have, they didn't want to have this harbor end up taking down the, the city of Ventura. So they created the Ventura Port District, they simply appoint the commissioners that run the harbor. There's no solid link between the two. And so when it came, when the bondholders ended up suing, the bondholders, when they built the village, the, the bank eventually literally walked in and threw their keys on the desk of the port district said, we're done, we're out of here, we tried running it, we're never going to get our money out, we're walking away. The bondholders said, okay, we want to take over because we're the underlying money that they're walking, we're the ones that put up the money. So they sued and the port district had to file bankruptcy because as, as a result of that. It did not change the structure of how the harbor was run. It's pretty much run the same way. There's a few little nuances that are different, different, but I don't think they're significant. One is that they get a portion of property tax money that I don't think that Mark benefits from any property tax money. 
where the port district, because they are an independent district, gets some portion of property tax money. Who owns Ventura Harbor? Uh, it's the Ventura Port District. I mean, my lease, for example, my ground lease for our marina up there was with the Ventura Port District, not with the city of Ventura. Although, if we built things, we had to go through the city. Or the county of Ventura. Well, just yeah. to add a word about John Glenn, I came in after some of the things you described. I mean, moved here after. But I did know John Flynn very well. And John Flynn was actually quite aware of the fact that this sign went in and nobody knew anything about it. But as soon as he found out that it drove everyone insane, he changed signs. And he sided with the politician change. Yeah, that's exactly. That was the actual <laughs> beginning of his demise. Well, that was, and that was the thing is that when the other board, when the other board members felt that it was important for them to take an interest in the harbor, that's when John started fighting to maintain the control he had already had, he had always had, and that fight, he, as we all know, he ultimately lost. And he was integral to starting the, the, the beat, the Yalai's you know, Beach. He, he, he served, created the Channel Islands Beach Community he Services served, District. Right. His chief of staff, Gerard Kapusik, he put from his office in to head the first of the Channel Islands Beach Community Services District. And Gerard was there uh, for a number of years. Um, Thank you for the information. I'm sorry to be the only unknowledgeable person here, but I'm wondering who you are and what your connection to these Harpers are. <laughs> so, I'm Randy Short. I'm the president and CEO of Almar uh, Marinas and Almar Management. We we operated. We recently sold the marina in Ventura Harbor. We operated Ventura Isle Marina there. Owned and operated Ventura Isle Marina there. We own and operate. Uh, we did own and operate one, two, three, four, four marinas here in this harbor. We're now down to three marinas in this harbor. Uh, but we operate marinas throughout California, Mexico, and Hawaii. And like I said, we've contributed 20 million since I've been around to... Of rent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. So Randy, you going to help us build the new marina on Front Peninsula? Yeah, yeah. He is going to build a new marina on Front Peninsula. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. Right. Yeah, that's part, of, that's part of the three projects, and hopefully you're going to break ground in October. I can't. Unfortunately, I'm not driving the bus. Uh, I have to, I can't do anything until the hotel demolishes the hotel, because I can't put any utilities. I can't do the basic infrastructure before that happens. That well, piece is on the agenda this coming week, right? Well, what I've got to do is I've got to, because I'm up against it, what I'm doing is we're extending the hotel developer a year, their option, because we but have to. On Tuesday. On Tuesday, that's you're, what we're doing. Got, oh, that you're, extending. you're extending their option. Again. Okay, well, I know. That's the first time we've extended it. I know, I know. Believe me. And I've taken part of the blame. I've taken part of the blame. You know we're going to stop putting the bricks down ourselves. Well, we, no, we, we underestimated the amount of rock work. There's no doubt about it. We, we thought it was going to be a maintenance. Well, it wasn't we at the time, but the, the heart of the thought it was going to be a maintenance job. And when we got the engineer out there, he said, no, it's a, it's a, it's a remove and replace. It's two and a half million dollars. It's going to take you six months. And, and, and the only way to really efficiently do it is wait till the hotel's not there so we can grab everything from the land. We're, and that did cost us. That cost us time. We're, we're lucky that Mark came in before things got too far along because Lynn Krieger's approach was to do a band-aid out there and Mark's approach has been to do it right. We're lucky that it all came in. Let's just yeah, I agree. <laughs> I appreciate that. So uh, before I turn it over, uh, I do want to, to recognize my staff. I've got uh, Jed Chernobayoff, who's my PIO. This actually, this whole Harbor Academy was his idea. And, um, and Claudia Navarez, who's my assistant, who's always been the one at the desk. And I want to recognize Robert Bravo. He's from the CEO's office. He's here uh, joining tonight. And uh, I'd like the CEO know if I take too many bruises. So let me, uh, let me turn this over to the university. Um, Michael. 
Michael Gravagna is going to be the one. Uh, can you tell us maybe when they're asked their company about this element too, what is the status of any kind of agreement, formal agreement, between the county and the state? Our operating agreement. Yes. yes. Yeah, what we'll, we'll, we'll begin, is, for those of you that pay attention, in 2016, this went to, the, the operating agreement went to the board. And at the time, the, the, board. the, the, board, the board of supervisors. Because the board of supervisors has to approve the operating agreement. And at the time, the university was running things different than they are now, and there was some criticism by at least two of the, the supervisors. And what happened was they said, wait, we're not going to approve this, come back. And it kind of fell to the gutter. Um, I knew that it, it, at a point in time, and, and, and I don't know if Michael's going to talk about it, but to their credit, they changed a lot of what they did after that meeting and, and answered a lot, in fact, answered every question I heard coming from the board at that meeting. And so I'm going to be the one that takes the operating agreement back to the board. What I wanted to do before that was this. So that when I go to the board, we could say, hey, we had a public session, we sought input, and, and, and now we're taking the operating agreement back to the board. So that's why we haven't yet. But there is, an, there is a draft operating agreement? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. And may we see it before it goes into effect? Um, well, the draft isn't public. I, I don't know how much has changed, and something might change uh, from now. That, we don't let, let me ask. Yeah, yeah, let me let me ask. Let me ask somebody that went to law school. <laughs> but but I mean I don't have a problem with that. But yeah, I mean ultimately it's going to be public because it's going to go. But really, yeah. so much of this distrust is from keeping the public in the dark I understand. the very last second. I understand. And letting us see the draft rather than having to scream about it when it is finalized is like I said I don't have a problem with it and uh, and just, just I just don't want to say yes now who can make the decision that would be our county council as to at what point it does yeah it, it may be I mean there, there may be a rule where I can't do that that's why I don't want to end up in jail or <laughs> in the unemployment line Hey, uh, Michael Gravagna will he'll introduce the you know his team here and he'll walk us through the next part of the presentation. So thank you, and I'll come back and we can both field questions at the end. Thank you, Mark. Um, first of all, thank you, Mark, and your staff for doing this. We've been we've been wanting to do something like this for a long time, so we're super excited to be here. We're really proud of the programming that we do. We want to be able to share that with folks so that they can also see what we're doing and hopefully be proud of that as well. Um, I would be remiss to not introduce a few folks, and I'll first start with our student staff. So all the, all the folks that sort of run around here that you see, they're the, uh, the young adults. Uh, they're CSUCI students. Uh, we couldn't do the things that we do without them, and so it's, it's fantastic to be able to have that uh, feeder system. They're getting a lot of experience, some real world experience uh, that they can translate when they graduate, and that's a fantastic experience for them. Um, so thank you to the students. And then I, I want to introduce uh, Josh Wade. He's our assistant director of campus recreation for Waterfront and Outdoor Adventures. And if you notice, there is an additional uh, responsibility there. So all of us wear many hats at the university, and it's not that Josh is solely responsible for just the program that's here. He's also running an outdoor adventure program for our students, which takes a little bit of his time, a lot of his time as well. And there's Jan Barabola, who's the coordinator of Waterfront and Outdoor Adventures as well. And so she does a lot of the orchestration to get some of the kids in the youth groups that we see uh, that come through here and some of the adult groups as well. Um, and I'm only talking about the program and not necessarily the classroom. Um, we talked a little bit about the purpose. Could you uh, back up for just one second? Sure. We're talking about Channel Islands, right? University? Yes. <laughs> I'll make that clear. I'm sorry. And then, sorry. and then, can you give us a really quick overview? Are, are you here every day? What? I don't know what you do. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. So my name is Mike Ravani, and I'm the director of campus recreation and student at wellness the university. at the university. Okay. I'm, my, my house is at the university. Josh and Jen are here all the time. Their offices are downstairs, and they do a lot of the programming and a lot of the other elements that are associated with the waterfront and the dock. Um, if I could interject, Mike, yeah, because I don't know, I don't know if you're going to cover it, but when when the Department of Boating and Waterways was granting money. They wanted an educational institution to be involved in their development center. Makes that's sense. that's why. That's right. the connection. Yeah. Right. So we're the, we're the state entity. Okay. okay. <laughs> so we talked about the purpose a little bit. The purpose of the voting center, in our minds, is that we want to educate 
uh, as many people as we can about the, 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 the vessels that we have, right? So we have sailboats, we have standard paddle boards, and we have kayaking. So the idea is that we want to teach the folks that come through here how to do it safely and how to do it the right way, navigate the traffic, navigate the harbor, and do it, do it uh, in, in accordance with what everybody's expectation is. So really our purpose is to provide access to safe boating and, and education uh, here at the Boating Center. And we do that through a number of ways, and we'll talk about that and kind of open that up in a little bit. I wanted to touch base on some recent highlights. Um, we've been here uh, for a while. I've been here five years. Josh has been here a lot longer than I have, and Jen came in when I came in. So I just wanted to touch on some recent highlights. Um, we regularly apply for the Division of Boating and Waterways grant, which is a small grant that helps us offset some of the costs. Uh, as many of you will know, doing anything on a boat is really expensive. Uh, we have to buy the vessels, we have to hire the students, we have to do all those things. So the university is funding a lot of the operations that we do, all of the operations that we do, uh, from a programmatic standpoint. Um, so they're paying the utilities, we have janitors, we have uh, dock cleaning because we have a sea line issue. Um, all of those things are paid for by the university. So I think it's fair to say that uh, our staff, uh, our student staff are paid by the university as well as our salaries as well. Um, so I want to make that perfectly clear. Um, but in 2000, since 2004, we've been successfully awarded the uh, Division of Boating and Waterways grant uh, to help offset some of those costs for our youth groups because uh, oftentimes we can't charge Boys and Girls Club as much as we would normally charge a group uh, because it's really expensive to do this. And so we want to offset those costs. Uh, also, those things go to a lot of scholarships for our summer camp, uh, which Josh will talk about in a little bit. Um, we average about 1,500 combined waterfront participants on an annual basis. That goes up and down. This year specifically, we had a lot of fires. Uh, we had a, a couple of other things that sort of hindered our programmatic stance. Uh, so um, we're not at quite at 1,500, but I said that that was an average. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at with that. Uh, this this year was a, a really cool thing that we did, and we participated in California Coastal Cleanup Day in 2019. Uh, and as such, and uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more, uh, we created classes surrounding that because we, we found that there was a lot of people that did that. As a matter of fact, uh, our young student here was the one who started that and, and really put us in and plugged us in with that. And so we found such success with that that we were like, let's do that from a kayaking standpoint and a standard paddling uh, standpoint. So we take our kayaks and we form a class and we go out in the harbor and we pick up trash and we bring it back. That particular day they picked up over 50 pounds of trash just in our harbor alone. So uh, we're trying to get back to the harbor as we, as we kind of move forward. Um, we continue partnership growth with new and existing community groups, which uh, Jen's going to talk to, to you all about that in a minute. We work with the Boys and Girls Club uh, and a number of other uh, different groups, um, and so it's important to, to talk about that. We expanded programming by adding free sailing and exploration classes, uh, and what that is is since what we're finding is that we have a sailing one-on-one, which Josh will talk about in a minute. We have a two-on-one, which is a more experienced class, but what we're finding is that uh, we didn't have any, anybody uh, that wanted less of a commitment, so it's a less time-intensive class. Uh, so that's available as well, and then I talked about the uh, kayaking and stand-up paddleboard classes that we added as well. Um, so all those things are, th are things that we're doing. Josh is going to talk a lot more about the programming, so I'm going to turn it over to him, and then I will give Jen a chance to speak about some of the communities. Yes? One of the things that is a major issue, and why I was delighted that Mark had programmed one of the academy sessions to be here in the voting center, is because of all the rancor that we experienced and went through for over 10 years in getting this place built and trying not to get it built, is that um, when we did get an EIR, and I have recently reread that entire gigantic document, EIR, um, before that operating agreement went to the Board of Supervisors, if you read just the beginning of the EIR, it lays out what the purposes are. And while it is not the number one purpose, one of the purposes is to be a community facility. Now, when I hear the word community, and a lot of the people sitting here will back me up on this, we think this area, meaning Silver Strand, Hollywood Beach, right. the communities north of the bridge, Oxnard Shores, the beach and harbor communities. Absolutely. We understand this is a regional harbor. We, we want tourists. We want people from other parts of the country. Right. But when we hear the word community, we think that there should be some things for us. And if you, if Josh would ever manage to get on next door, which I have begged him to do, I don't know how many times. Um, you would read 
the nasty comments about the voting center and how there's nothing for us and it's never open and blah, blah, blah. And people still feel that way because it's rare that we do open it up. Now, there have been lectures here starting, Celine, I think they started like two years, four, a couple five, years ago, yeah. four or five years ago. So I remember the first lecture was like one of the best lectures I ever went to in my life by somebody who studies authors here. Cool. Hawaii, she's at Cal State Channel's professor, and I've never forgotten this. Um, and okay. then, of course, we were able to get the Ocean Life Long Learning series here right. last, right. last summer, and we got a big spread out on the patio and whatnot. But other than that, the feeling is it's not part of our community, and we're not welcome or invited in, or even what you just said about the cleanup in the harbor. Mm -hmm. There was some publicity about a harbor cleanup on next door, but no real effort to enlist everybody in doing right. that, like we do the beach cleanup, right. which is a major, major thing. Right. So I, I think I wanted to get that out there, that you know that is <coughs> a major consideration, is to try to integrate this facility into the community area the wider beach and harbor communities. Thank you. Uh, I get one more question. Can I address that first and then, or? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, I just want to also uh, highlight, as far as the DBW funding, there's four other quote unquote voting centers within the state of California, which are operated under a CSU, and that is in Sacramento, Humboldt, Northridge, and San Diego. And we're part of that. So all of those centers, we're just, we're doing similar things and all of them are open to community, just like we are. Um, and so anybody can participate in any of the number of the programs that we're gonna be talking about here in a minute. Um, and do, yeah. community members do. So, so how would you find out about it? I mean, I thought this was just not for us. So like, we can, if I can go through a lot of this information and then I can, we, at the end of the day, we can give you our contact information and we can hopefully adjust those concerns as well. And then, go ahead. Two things. One, the 1,500 participants. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is the, what is the proportion of uh, uh, college students and others? It's about five, five or three to one. Uh, community, we have more community involvement than CI students. Uh, the last few years, we've had 2,100 community members and 600 CI students. So, so can it, can we just go through <laughs> go through a presentation? I feel like we're going to get a lot of questions answered, and then that way, uh, because I, f I feel like you all already saw this before because you're asking <laughs> questions. I feel like we're going to address here. So, I wonder why you. When I tried to sign up for things here, I had to go through the colleges. I had to sign in as though I were a college student. We're, I, I was never able to complete it. None of it applied to me. We're working on that, and we recognize that there were some issues there. As a matter of fact, we're addressing that. Uh, and one of, the, one of the considerations was we don't even know where your website is. And so we took that away from the university, and we have a standalone website now that is connected to the county. Um, and it's, it's been pretty public for, um, I think, about a, about a year or two yeah, years now. No, we didn't know that. We, yeah. didn't, we have no idea. Nobody told so us that. So we'll get through this, and then we'll, we, all of that stuff will be on there, and we're hoping that you all can be the stewards for us and sort of go out and, and talk about those things, and, uh, and we'll, we'll all be excited together. Josh, i, I got to speak up. Sure. You and I know each other. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm the immediate past chairman of the Voting and Waterways Commission. And I can tell you that at least three of my commissioners were absolutely adamant about the poor performance of two businesses, Channel Islands and Silver Strait. And having toured a good portion of this in the, in the state, including Humboldt, which is in the most terrible place for a climate to go paddling and do these things. Having, having visited that site, we couldn't even tour the building with my commission because it was so busy. And they didn't want to disrupt the classrooms and the things that were going on in that facility during the week, let alone on the weekend. I mean, the Humboldt State has several national championships for rowing 
those programs are going just non-stop I mean, in the morning early in the morning till late at night and for you to talk about those three that are within the same Cal State program as if as if this is even close is really disingenuous. Sure. No, I, I mean, mean Glenn Brandenburg who set up yeah. the he not only set up Mission Base Aquatic Center, I mean if you look at that center, oh, it is amazing. just going flat. It's amazing. Well, I think and, and then you look at Humboldt, you know, you look at those and you look at those universities. And I'm not believe me, I'm not blaming you, Josh, or you, Jen. I think you guys have tremendous spirit. I I put the entire blame right square on the university. That the university is has no idea what they're doing and how to do this. And yet the examples are right there within the Cal State University system. And to not be out there, you mentioned the website, for example. Go to the website for Cal for Mission Bay Aquatic or Humboldt and then compare it side by side with yours. My commission has. And it's shocking sure. the, the difference. And that, like I said, I'm not pointing at you guys, I'm pointing squarely at the university. Right. Maybe if we can have the presentation first, you might, it might be answering some of the questions. This is getting so far off kilter. Well, I, I appreciate everybody uh, kind of asking the questions before the presentation. It makes it interesting. I appreciate, you know, all the info. Um, and then we'll be sure, Jen, Mike, and I will leave our contact information so that we can be completely accessible. And our contact information is posted outside the building 24 hours a day as well. Um, so let me jump right in if that's okay. We all okay? All right. So. With our programming aspects for the Channel is Bunny Center, we basically have five components. The first component is instructional classes, and when I say classes, th those are non-credit recreational classes. We also have uh, community groups, internal CI groups, we do land-based activities also that where we're able to incorporate some environmental education, also some safe boating education, and then we also run a summer water sports camp. So our instructional classes, we basically have three subcomponents of those. And so we have sailing classes, kayaking classes, stand-up paddleboarding classes. And um, like Mike mentioned earlier, the major change with the stand-up paddleboarding classes and the kayaking classes is that we incorporated a coastal cleanup aspect to that so that we can hopefully continue to beautify the harbor while they're on the water. Um, the thing that I like to highlight with the sailing classes is that our sailing exploration is actually free, so anybody can participate in that. Um, and then the other thing I want to highlight with this segment is, like Mike mentioned earlier, all of our um, instructors, whether they're teaching sailing, windsurfing, or stand-up paddleboarding, if it's not myself, they're all college students. And um, so they're balancing their academic workload as well as working up to 20 hours out here and then up to 40 hours during the summer. What's unique about that is that anybody from the community can sign up for a sailing, uh, stand-up paddleboarding or kayaking class, and they can learn those safe boating aspects of that sport, as well as find out information about the university, what, uh, you know, what major they're in, and then also hear about what we have going on on campus. Some of the... Um, Community groups, but before I do that, I also want to highlight too is um, we'd like to focus on safety as well for all of our programming out here. So all of our instructors, our college students, are lifeguard certified, and they also go through intensive training in either sailing, kayaking, or stand-up paddleboarding, and they also do a monthly in-service training as well. Um, and it's interesting because we, we not only need to teach the safety aspects of that sport, but we also need to pay attention about how to uh, do conflict resolution, whether it's to adults or and then also with kids. We, we work a lot with youth, which Jen will talk about here in a minute, and that is a whole other animal besides just trying to keep people safe on the water. 
So with our community groups, we have uh, six categories of that. We have active school programming, field trips, uh, weekend adventures. We do merit badge activities with the Boy Scouts. Uh, we also have the Girl Scouts, but they don't do merit badges. And we also do adult outings and youth groups. I feel like I should bow. Thank you for your time. I'm still here. I won't go anywhere. Uh, so again, I'm Jen, uh, and I, Josh and I wear many hats, but one of my big hats is community outreach. Um, obviously, you know we're part of the university, so we have this awesome opportunity to put education at our core. Um, so everything we do out here is with education in mind. We do not have NCAA athletics, so I think that's where some of the confusion comes in. We don't have rowing, we don't have NCAA athletics on the campus. So that does separate us from other things. But we do have this awesome voting center. And part of what the university loves is community outreach and community involvement. And we want our students to do that, and we want the center to do that. So I hope we all walk away understanding that all these groups and more have been in here in just the last 18 months, um, and we have a lot more coming up. So please look at this while I'm talking, so you can, uh, one, see the groups we're touching in this harbor. So I'm glad you brought that up, because just two weeks ago we had Hollywood Beach Middle School here. Uh, tomorrow at 12, if you want to come on by, we have Port, uh, we have Wainimi High School come in, bringing 30 students. And then on Sunday we have a school, uh, we have a Girl Scouts group coming. And this is all before our summer camp, which is all local kids. So I want to highlight that because we're really proud of it. Um, so the community groups, uh, we do outreach to students in groups that can't necessarily go with their family and go down this, uh, the street here and pay for kayaking or pay for stand-up paddleboarding. We want to do outreach where we can subsidize some of the costs through the Department of Boating and Waterways and get these kids here to access the waters. I don't know if you're familiar with the statistics, but over 4 million unregistered kayaking stand-up paddleboards uh, occupants are in California right now. What does that mean when we drive up traffic in harbors and on waterways? There's more accidents, there's more injuries, and there's more deaths. So we want to work with the Department of Boating and Waterways and work with the university to provide access and safe boating education. So that is that everything that we do and to provide to kids right here in our backyard in California, in Southern California, that do not have the accessibility even four, two miles away from the beach. So we want to make sure that that's at our forefront. Um, so I was already talking about the Boys and Girls Club. We're in a two-year contract, and we're, we're moving forward to our third year. They're here every Friday um, from, oh gosh, depending on what time they could get here, uh, we hope 3.45 to about 5.30. And they're here every Friday doing kayak and their stand-up paddleboarding. I printed out, um, if those are familiar with the Boys and Girls Club, I printed out a really nice email that the, the director of athletics there has sent. It's on our board out here. Uh, he couldn't make it here tonight. Just to talk about how much that uh, partnership has meant to the kids and how much it has meant to us. And again, our college students are part of our community. They are going to go out in the world and be hopefully really good members of society, and I think they are. And so that's a really good contract that we've been having with them. Uh, those who are familiar with Oxnard, RJ Frank, we were with them for two years. Uh, they brought 50 kids for 10 weeks in a row every year. Um, astronomical numbers, and they would bring 50 kids, their teacher would bring them to the beach, uh, half of them, and we would take half on kayaking, and they would swap, and that contract was for two years. Unfortunately, their funding fell through, and we didn't have the resources anymore to help them out, but that was just another local um, partnership that I want to highlight. Uh, we work with um, the Oxnard High School Multimedia Business Academy, they're here all day, um, and then just some others, I don't want to go through everything, but you can see how much we are reaching out to the community right here. And this is in addition to all the classes that Josh mentioned. So all everyone's invited to the, the classes. So if you look at it from a program at programs, how many programs are we offering? That's well over 100 in just a, in one academic year, not a calendar year, an academic year. Uh, moving forward, uh, we do work with a lot of CSU CI groups because we are part of the university. Uh, we are housed in the Department of uh, department, Campus Recreation. Um, and what that means is that when you go to college, if you went to college or you have someone in college, one of the best parts of being part of a college community is a campus recreation department. And since we don't have athletics, we can hang our hat on Mike's Center on campus, which is the campus recreation center, and then this out here. Um, in addition to that, I have staff members or faculty members who contact me like, we want to work on communication, we want to work on teamwork, we want to work on any type of team building aspect that we, we can. So we don't just go on the water when kids get here. It's about experience, it's about experiential learning. So when the kids come out here, the students come out here rather, 
we're working with them on land, and then we bring them on water. Uh, we play games on the water, we do team building activities on the water, and then we come off. So it's really a day. Um, now, granted, there might be some groups that they might only have an hour and a half, so we do get more focused on the water. Uh, so I won't go through all of these groups, but this again was in the last 18 months. We work with all of these groups in addition to the, the ones before. And I just want to add too that the, despite the students being students, they're also Ventura County residents, most of them. So they're also still part of our community, and I think that gets lost when we talk about the students versus sure. the community because they still are, in a sense, part of this community. And there's right. several folks that live a mile away that haven't even been in the harbor because they're afraid of what's underneath the water or they can't swim. Right. And so we're providing that sort of intro to a lot of these things that they otherwise wouldn't have that right. experience. Um, I, I get the pleasure of reading all the emails and follow-up from guardians and parents who tell me we were on a trip on the Colorado River or we were on this and the boat capsized and my, your, my kid was able to get back on a right, right the boat because of your camp or because of when they visited the boating center. That's what we, I think, as a whole boating community want to hear, right? We want to hear that kids are being safe um, and that they're accessing water. Oh, uh, good. Do you get swimming lessons? Uh, we don't necessarily give swimming lessons, no. Uh, we get them comfortable in their life jacket, though, and let them know that they're okay in the water. But as far as, like, strokes or something like the YMCA does, we do not do that. Yeah. But part of our summer camp, it's part of the, uh, it's on the first day. We get kids in the water, and they have to swim 50 meters. It's not that, not that long. Um, just to get them comfortable and let them know that they're safe in a life jacket. Because that's part of the safe boating education. And in the ocean. Yeah. The folks the ocean. Out there. Right. So as I said, we're, we are a little different in that we provide an experience. We also provide a lot of marine education. Uh, so we've been working with Noah a little more, who's a partner in the building, and they come and present at our summer camp uh, to do marine education. We don't have kids in the water all day, every day, because they need a break. They have a, their attention span needs a little bit of a break from the water. They need a little bit of a break from the sun. Um, and why not talk about the Channel Islands? Why not talk about what's great about this marina? Why not talk about all that? So that component right there sets us a little bit aside, uh, different from other camps who are just sailing focused. Uh, we are sailing, stand up paddle work, windsurfing, and kayaking in the summer. So we do add in that windsurfing component. Unfortunately, that's not offered for everyone uh, outside of camp. Um, so again, we'll do nav navigational scavenger hunts. I mean, I do see some of you walking by, and I, I, I always think, I wonder, I wonder what people think we're doing when our kids are just like on the land on, a, on an awesome scavenger hunt. They're part of us. They're part of the programming. Um, and we have had amazing conversations with a lot of community members. Uh, Rachel here, one of the students, she has gotten so many dog sitting gigs actually <laughs> out of talking to all the community that walks by. So on most days, if you were to walk by, especially in the next eight weeks, you're going to see us out and about, you're going to see us in the water, you're going to see us running back and forth to the beach, uh, and I invite you in to come do that. Uh, again, the water sports camp, this is our, Josh, 14th year? Yeah. 14th year. Uh, obviously the building's only been here five now, so before that, before Mike and I's time, Josh would have to drive a truck from the university with all the equipment here and then drive back every day. Um, so we are very fortunate to have this, uh, this building and to be housed here. Uh, we bring in about 210 kids every summer. It used to be more until we realized we needed to move the older kids to a two-week session. One sailing, we wanted to advance the kids to another week and let them work on their skills and go out more in the open water if they're ready. Uh, and two, it, it just helped the older kids develop their skills in all the sports, and the parents and guardians were just loving that they could drop their kids off for two weeks straight and we could get them tired. And then <coughs> with, the, with the harbor, we work with the Oxar Marine Center. So if you've been over there, we bring our kids there weekly. Um, we used to go next door to the, uh, the Maritime Museum as well, and we stopped that about two years ago. Because uh, we wanted to bring in more marine science here into the building with our partners of NOAA and then our own colleagues from Santa, R Research Island, Santa Rosa Research Island Station. So they also come and talk to our kids. So we really hang our hat on being a marine education water sports camp. Um, I think it's really important. So how do we advertise, you're asking? Well, we're all going to go check out the website after this uh, presentation. We all know it's out there, ciboating.org. Please check it out. Um, and then we also table at all these events that you're looking at, plus some. So we're always on campus at all the student organizational uh, presentations that happen. We participate in U.S. Coast Guard Safe Boating Expo that just happened in May. Uh, the Port Wayne Youth Involvement Fair, they just had their second one this year. So it's 
I don't know if it's picked up ground for you guys to hear about it, but we go and table at that and we hand out supplies and we play games with the kids that are there. Boys and Girls uh, Club Community Youth Day, it's huge. They bring in all the nonprofits in the whole uh, area and we go and play, uh, well we do, we go and play games with them and our students love it because it kind of takes them off the water, gets them in the community and they get to hand out and talk about who we are. Um, and the Chowder Fest, we, we, we partner with them a little bit and we make sure that we're open that if they need to store stuff in our boatyard, if they need to hand out or uh, hang up posters and stuff to advertise their event, that they could do that. Uh, you Glen Safety Day up in Camarillo and the Chumash Tumult Crossing, that happens every year if the stars are aligned and they actually sleep here overnight and they take off from our dock at 2 in the morning. Every year we are a partner in that. Uh, we're an election polling site and then we have the, again, the, the California Coastal Cleanup Day. Um, so I uh, think that there's our contact information. I also have our my business card. I, I appreciate you contact me directly for the community outreach. And if you are involved in an organization, nonprofit or for profit, I want to hear about it if you want to bring your group here. Or if you're a parent or a grandparent on a school board or anything, that's how we also advertise, it's by word of mouth. I have a question about the school programs. Yes. Um, are you contracting with school districts? Do they have to pay? They do have to pay. Yep, yeah, and it is a contract. So, so are there are any programs that are free for children? Yes, so uh, good question. So our camp, 50% of our campers are all free. And that is actually funded by the Dep Department of Boating and Waterways. So that's, that's in the summer, but I'm right. talking about during the year, yeah. are there any programs for children? Because even the Boys and Girls Club, you said, it's a contract. Yeah. So how do parents, you know, if they want their kids to have an experience, mm -hmm. how would they do that? Well, the Boys and Girls Club pays $5 per kid up to 60, and they bring us 150 kids. So we're making three hundred dollars on something that we should be making well over two thousand dollars on, and we're not making any money. It's an organized group, right? So everything is a contract. So, but we can sell the contract and it not cost anything. But since we are a state entity and there is risk involved, and that's something else that I could outreach to ten schools, and I might only hear back from two because once they see water, they don't want to take the risk. So do you, do you apply for grants that could cover school programs? Right, so that's the Department of Boating and Waterways, that's the main grant that we did. And it does subsidize, and then our campus recreation program and the university subsidizes a lot. I, I don't have the exact percentage, but yes. Like tomorrow, the group coming, again, it would cost $30 per person, we're charging five, and campus recreation department, the university, is subsidizing for us. Jim, On, you're leaving out the Channel Islands Harbor Foundation. I, we do not receive funding from the Channel Islands Harbor Foundation. Yeah, you do. Uh, we have not recently. Maria, the transportation costs to get the kids here. And the BWET grant, too, is also not way to get schools here. Right, we have worked with the, with the BWET. Unfortunately, when COS passed away, there was some, some, some lack in that program. Um, but we've worked with BWET how many times? Channel Numerous. Channel Islands Harbor Foundation. I sit on the board, mm -hmm. as does our. I've seen President Walker. No, I guess you're not president. Josh, you can answer that. Okay. Actually, yeah. um, I'm Selena. I'm the Director of Community Government Relations, and I just got on to the Channel Islands Harbor Foundation for that purpose. But to say that the Channel Islands Harbor Foundation, it, unless you know about it, you we get the Maria Grant. These individuals don't know that the Maria Grant is funded to the Channel Islands Harbor Foundation. I just learned that myself. So now that I'm on the foundation board, I think that's going to be very helpful because, for example, Jen just shared this long list of events that I said, okay, now we need to figure out how do we incorporate the educational component and be a partner in it. So I think me being on the foundation board is going to be very helpful to the public side. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, has the university changed its policy about storing boats here? Uh, it has not, and uh, Josh last, and you are... Last time I talked to you... Well, we're not a storage facility, so we're really staying clear of that. Um, with everything we just talked about, we really want to stay focused on safe footed education. And since we are a state entity, um, if we let one person in, you know, how are we going to say no to the next person? But, but, uh